I posted this video warning you not to use Coke cans for your telescoping tube DIY projects, and I received a lot of feedback. I use cardboard box. Pencil lead breaks up nicely. Printer paper and burn it. Just use Dom, you idiot. But could all these options really work? I think there's some variables that need to be considered for this. In this video, I'm gonna get to the bottom of this. Your plate weld joint's good. No gapped weld joint is good. Here's the moment of truth. So in that video, I used two pieces of angle iron welded together to create a telescoping tube that I used for my bench vise. There it is. And it's working quite nicely. But I learned two very important things from that project. The first thing that I learned was that the spacing using Coke cans did not work. It pinched down, no go, no bueno, don't do it. The second thing I learned for spacing your DIY telescope in two projects is that MIG wire actually works quite well at first. But after I put that initial weld and it was, it was telescoping correctly, I put additional welds and I ended up having to grind off quite a bit of material to get it to telescope. So I think the weld joint, when you're constructing your outside tube for the telescoping tube, has a huge impact as to what spacing you should use for the setup process. So I think having a gap at these two corners here and here are really what led to the issues and the weld distortion with every weld pass. So I'm gonna try creating a telescoping tube with the two angle irons, but instead of having gaps at those corners, I'm gonna overlap the gaps or overlap the corners like you see here to where they're essentially mechanically locked. I'm then going to just take some regular old 3 8 steel plate and I'm gonna make four, four pieces like that. Two of the pieces are gonna be oversized on the top and the bottom, we'll say, and then I'm gonna put a fillet weld on either of those sides. Now, because they are essentially locked or, or resting on the other plates, this one should act similarly with the no gap. So I'm gonna test that one alongside this one and the control which is what I already know uh, the behavior of. What do you call a fish that's wearing a bow tie? Sophisticated. <laughs> Enough joking around. This tube is exactly two and a half inches. Let's sharpen my chalk up a little bit. There we go. Let's cut some metal. So as I was cutting this piece, it dawned on me, this piece and this piece, because they're sandwiched in between this top piece and this lower piece, have to be perfect in regards to the spacing. Really, at that point, there's no need for uh, the wire except for, for the spacing in between them. I think a better thing to do is to scratch having the top and the bottom long and make every single one of them long. the correct spacing with poorly cut pieces or not precisely cut pieces all the way around and still get our required square here. So let's cut these pieces a little bit long and set it up this way so we can mechanically make sure all these are touching in the shimmed position with that wire.
So I might have to tack this in place with two sides, kind of just work my way around. To get the right dimension on these, I put some blue Sharpie down and then scraped the edge of a plate that I ground down uh, to get a scoring mark at the exact 2.5 dimension that was needed. I then went through and used my Evolution cold cut saw to cut it down to that mark. Worked out pretty nicely, but you'll see a little bit later on that I made a couple mistakes with that. I went through and cut both edges of the no-gapped angle iron, and then I went through and cut one side of the gapped angle iron. So I'm using that 025 wire to get the right fit up with this gapped angle iron here. And then once I get it, I use these F clamps to get a nice tight fit up. It worked quite nicely, and I went through and tacked these up. However, after I let the tacks cool, the piece clamped together pretty hard and it took a ton of effort to get off of this two and a half inch square tubing. But I did, and you'll see in a second that it still would telescope. There you go. So I moved on to the no gap angles to get the right fit up. I put the wire in and then again, I used the F clamps to get everything clamped up nicely. I found that vertically aligning everything was a lot easier than trying to do it sideways as I did on the first one. Now I went through and tacked these up and you're gonna see here, I had to put a couple of tacks on the one side because there was a gap and we'll fix that here in a second. All three of them slid over that two and a half inch square tubing nicely as expected. No gap angle, my gap angle, my plate. What I'm gonna do is measure both sides of each of those and log it on a chart before welding, after one pass of welding, and then the final weld state. So we'll have three dimensions and we'll be able to see how sensitive each one of these are to each pass of the weld. So we have all of our numbers logged. Now I'm gonna put one pass on each of these. I'm gonna edit the, the no gap angle to have that piece uh, to mechanically lock it and then after one pass, I'll measure everything up and then we'll move to two passes. Let's look at our first pass. Here is our no gap. So that was mechanically locked. Essentially, uh, I ran it pretty hot on I-8 for the welder settings. That is gonna be uh, equivalent to a 3 8 weld there um, for the settings, the suggested settings by Harbor Freight. So the pattern I used on that was a V back and forth in front of the puddle, leading it along the way. This is our gapped with angle piece. I was having a lot of trouble with the gap um, burning through. So it was, I was running pretty hot for that 3 8 thickness. And so what I ended up doing was a tack welding method where, where I would do a little bit of a motion, I'd stop, 
I do a little motion, stop, little motion, stop. And it looks, it looks cool, uh, but it definitely didn't burn as hot as this one. So that might skew the results ever so slightly. And then we have our plate. I did turn the heat down to F 5.5 for the suggested settings on this one as it is quarter inch versus the three eighths there. I did a little bit of a circle motion, uh, cursive ease, I guess you could say, as I went and put the welds on that one. All right, there you go. First pass is finished. I'm gonna let those cool and then we'll go ahead and fill out our little chart here. Now I'm gonna do the final welding on these test pieces. In order to keep everything apples to apples, I wanted to make sure and have the same heat input or similar heat input into every one of these pieces. So I added two weld passes to every single joint. We're all finished up here and you can see quite a bit of heat was input into those plates as there's a lot of blue on the edges. I went through and measured all the final numbers here to see what the final verdict of this testing period was. So let's go ahead and take a look at the numbers to see what the results are. So here is the spreadsheet I put together for all of the dimensions that I took from each of these test specimens. This includes the no gapped angle, the gapped angle and the plates test specimen off here to the left. And then up above there, you can see the sections for the tack, the first pass weld, and the final weld states. There were eight dimensions for each of these conditions and test specimens, as I wanted to make sure and get plenty of measurements to get a good trend instead of being uh, dependent on a single dimension. And then over here to the right side, you can see that the average spacing for my no gapped angle was 2.537. So we're 37 thou over what that square tube is. The gapped angle ended up at 10 thou over the square tubing and the plate ended up being exactly the same at 37 thou as the no gapped angle. Now, as far as the delta average or the difference uh, indicating what the actual weld draw was between these tests, you can see the no gap angle had a negative 001 weld draw indicating that it actually increased in size instead of de decreased in size at that dimension. The gapped angle had 8 thou of average weld draw over all the dimensions that I took, indicating there was some amount of change because of the weld geometry there. And then the plate version with just those fillets had about 1,000 of dimension reduction or weld draw in that joint as well. So down below, you can see the two charts here. The one to the left side really indicates that the green, which is our gapped angle, uh, did decrease as you went along with your weld passes, whereas the no gapped angle in the plate test specimen stayed relatively flat. Here, the bar graph to the right here really makes it apparent that the gapped angle had quite a bit more weld draw than the other two test cases, which is as expected. Now, these are a lot of cool numbers, but what do they actually mean? Are these pieces going to be able to telescope or not? So to figure this out, I had to go through and use a die grinder to knock down the root pass uh, that protruded inside of that telescoping tube just a little bit there. And then I had to use a file to get rid of a lot of the spatter that came through as well. So here's our plate with our four sides. This one easily goes back on. Here's our no gap, which on the one side, I had it essentially no gap in between the two corners. And the other side, due to my cutting error, had a piece welded in there. I don't know if you can see it there. And then a butt weld on this side and a butt weld on this side. And that one goes on clean as butter. And last but not least is our gapped one, where we had a gap. You can see it in there. Weld filled the gap. But these two, there was a gap, and these two, there was a gap. Let's see. Here's the moment of truth. Nope. 
Let's try it this way. Nope. Nope. There you have it. Here's our weld joints. Your plate weld joint's good. Your no gapped weld joint is good. Your gapped weld joint with the two angles is not. Wah, wah, wah.